So thank you all for your time. Um, I'd like to thank the Grains Research and Development Corporation for giving me this uh, game-changing opportunity. They've been strong sponsors of, of Nuffield for a long time. Uh, our year, there are actually four uh, funded scholarships provided, and I think our industry is all the better for their support. So I'll start. Wayne Gretzky, probably the greatest ice hockey player of all time. A good hockey player plays where the puck is. A great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. Now I think that's a great analogy for looking at on-farm storage. They're long-lived investments. When you look at building grain storage, you're looking 10, 20, 30 years plus out into the future. So it's not just necessarily what's working now, you need to consider the future. And so what I, what I did, I looked at whole grain supply chain systems, particularly in the UK and continental Europe, and then throughout North America. Then also implications, managing store in their environments and what we might have to do um, in terms of our management. So we'll start at the beginning. So here's your typical on-farm storage. This is our rich farms in uh, Iowa in the US. Flat bottom storage using aeration. These guys are big corn growers. There's a little thing here I'll touch on this. I'll get my melon out of the way so you can see this little grain period. We'll, we'll touch on this later on. But I thought we'd take you through the journey. So this is pretty typical on farm storage. And we look at a snapshot. America is the home of grain production, grain storage and logistics. So here's some trends. They're also the home of collecting data. So this is a great snapshot of some trends over time. The ratio between, of grain, between grain being stored on farm and off farm in elevator space hasn't changed much over time. As you can see by this green line here, what has happened is that the overall crop size has grown. So both on-farm and off-farm elevated space has increased. And so these are one of the little gems you come across in a Nuffield scholarship. So I was, I was teed up to go visit uh, Brock Silos in uh, Milford, Indiana. And I, I ran across this guy in the foyer. Um, uh, Tom was his name, just got chatting. He said, oh yeah, I'm actually building this uh, new, you know, little elevator um, site just up the road. And I got chatting. He said, oh, I'm finished here at midday, can I come up and have a look? And he goes, yeah, yeah, sure, no worries. And little did I know, I stumbled across the True Point Cooperative Cargo Joint, Joint Venture Elevator site. They happened to be building a two, two mile, 3.2 kilometre rail loop, the largest in North America at the time, capable of loading a 160 car unit train without having to split. So we're talking nearly 16,000 tonnes, 15 odd thousand tonnes of grain without splitting. And Tom was extremely generous with his time. Like he's worked on some big projects and he, he pulled up what he was doing and gave me a, a complete tour. I was absolutely blown away. One of the things that I was very impressed with was how organised and his planning. Um, so I can give you, give you any advice. Be like Tom, be organised and plan ahead. And so here's the, the picture. Here's the story of what's happening in the US. Uh, we've got mainline rail efficiency, which allows these large uh, elevators to move that uh, grain efficiently onto rail. And we can see over time that, so th these are 75 rail cars plus, so your typical shuttle trains around 100, 110 rail cars. So you can see the growth in the amount of grain that has been moved by this mode. So that's, this is the trend that's been observed in the US. So that's what's happening in the US. Let's jump over the border up to Canada into wheat growing country. Uh, this, is a, this is a fairly typical uh, shuttle loading facility in Canada. It was actually built as a grower cooperative and has since been sold to Viterra, which is now owned by Glencore. Uh, the key point I want to raise here is that this site actually only has capacity for 40,000 tonnes, but last year they actually handled around 340,000 times. So, so 340,000 tonnes. So the site was turned over 8.5 times. Canadian growers typically store about 70% of their crop on farm and then they'll run it into loading facilities like this throughout the year. And the other point is that this is not actually on their main, main rail line. This is on a branch line that's a short distance to feed onto main rail. So this site, while not on the main rail line, gets the benefit of main line rail efficiencies. And the other thing I noticed is that Canada had a lot of sites like what we've got in Australia, some older, smaller sites, but a lot of those have been closed down. They've effectively rebuilt 
their home, whole storage network of the last 20, 30 years with shuttle elevators like you've just seen on the last slide. And if you look here, you can see the decline in the number of elevators, but actual overall elevator storage capacity has increased. And so what's the impact of efficient main, mainline rail in these large shuttle hubs that can be more efficient and pay a higher, higher price to the grower? You look at small, medium, large, efficient shuttle rail loaders. And you'll see some of these little small ones, which the grower used to deliver to, but now gets a better price, driving further, but to the higher price point. So here's a snapshot of the North American rail network. So these guys are the leaders in terms of moving freight on rail. And I emphasise moving freight. So they're not just moving grain, they're moving oil, they're moving steel, they're moving coal, um, automobiles. So not only is grain moved and funding this rail network, but you've got general freight. And it's moved out through these three major port destinations. And this is something I will touch on for implications for the Australian network. So, you know, this is all great. You go and travel overseas, you see all these great things. What does it actually mean uh, when you come back to Australia? So, what happens if a typical Aussie grower could get an extra $10 a tonne for their grain? They grow three tonnes a hectare, 30 bucks a hectare of revenue, uh, land worth 2,000 a hectare, that would give them an extra 1.5% return investment. So I want to focus on that. doesn't matter what business you're in, whether you're in chickens, guava, mangoes. You know, I think that's something we'd all be after. So here's a map of uh, the rail network in, uh, in Australia. And you can draw one of these for each state. And actually, if you draw them by each state, the only thing that's different is that the the width of these, of these uh, webs are different. They, can't, they won't even talk to each other. Um, and if we go and have a look, this is, this is what it was built for, trucks that look like that. That's when grain growing was hard work. And this produces this chart. So you'll see that current top orange line, that's the current price differential that the East Coast grower receives compared to the port price. And this is, so there's about $10 a tonne, this is Grain Corp analysis, there's about $10 a tonne that could be improved, internal analysis, if they can get some efficient inefficiencies worked out in the system. You can see WA here, and this is the Canadian National. So this efficient mainline rail delivers some additional savings than what we can, what, than what we can generate with our rail network. And to be fair, we probably can't get to, to 20, but what if we can get five, 10, or $15 closer? You know, so, so how do we get there? H how do we get this extra 1.5% return on investment? So we've just been through an election cycle, um, and this is something that, in principle, both sides of politics uh, support, not funded, not committed, but it's been discussed. So an inland container terminal, not at the port, we're in the suburbs of Melbourne, so we haven't got it to a port. Con inland container terminal in the suburbs of Brisbane, again, we're not at the port, but here's a potential mainline rail solution for East Coast. And again, the benefit is, this is predominantly funded by general container freight between Melbourne and Brisbane. The grains industry doesn't have to fund the building of this rail line on their own. And what it would actually do, it would change the system, the way we move grain, particularly on the East Coast. So rather than feeding individual state-based rail networks, we actually feed into a main rail line. So it could be efficient site on a branch line, short haul to the main line. We could be loading B triples on dedicated upgraded roads to feed this main rail line. And this is how we start to look at gaining some efficiencies, pulling some costs out of the system. So, and I'll, and I'll pull back. One of the things that, as a grains industry, that would then happen is that currently there's a lot of flexibility built into um, the Australian logistics network. So we've used a lot of roads, so hence we're a bit more expensive relatively. Um, our export programs are front-ended, so a lot of the grain tends to be exported you know, within six months of harvest. 
Uh, if we moved to this sort of a system, growers would be storing longer and we could be easily exporting more throughout the 12 month window. So there's some implications from a management point of view. So one of the things I did when I was in the US, uh, I visited uh, Purdue University run workshop. So the land grant uh, universities do a lot of the extension, pretty similar to what our um, Department of Ags, uh, state based Department of Ags do um, in this country. And I was actually really, really impressed with some of the extension work they were doing. Um, so this was um, an extension workshop they were doing for um, grain handlers, uh, growers, for the upcoming corn harvest. So they're updating them, let's say this year it's a wetter year, you're looking at higher moisture, you've got mould, fungus, peep updating, and they're also talking about some risk management and just, just good general management of grain in store. So treating grain and silo like money in the bank and a big emphasis on keeping grain in condition. So if you get it right from the start, get your aeration right, your hygiene right, you're 95% of the way there. And this guy, Bill Field, he then went on to show what happens if you don't get it right. And he's actually holding up a harness if something goes wrong in the silo and you've actually got to climb in and resolve it. Before I jump over the next slide, um, I want to just comment on the very strong linkages between the CSIRO and the GRDC um, with the US universities. So I know um, Kansas, Kansas State, Purdue, um, very close contact with our own researchers here, which keeps us at uh, the cutting edge in terms of uh, managing pests in grain. So here's that pyramid that we discovered on our early on in the journey at the Rich Farms in Iowa. Um, so this was the example that Bill Field showed. So this is what happens when you get grain storage wrong. Uh, you don't get the aeration right, um, the grain goes mouldy and you get a big lump. This is a very extreme case. I'd hate to, I've never found a lump that big in one of my silos. I found some small ones. We don't always get it right. It was actually some of the emphasis to, to look at how I could do it better. But this case here, they've got it wrong. This giant lump has blocked the outtake auger on the bottom. Farmer has to climb into the silo to try and, try and free it to get the grain. He's got trucks turning up, got this grain out of the silo, onto the truck. And unfortunately, this particular example resulted in a fatality. So this is what happens when you get it wrong. So not only have you done, the, done your dough on the cash in the bank and the grain in the silo, but this has actually resulted in a fatality. So that's why getting this management is so important. Um, and again, this is fantastic. Go and, go and learn this. I've, I've learned a lot. Um, so this is actually <coughs> a photo of a similar thing, but this is up the road from me, up at Gilgandra with our local grower group. Uh, Peter Botter, GRDC funded uh, extension guy, um, doing a, a silo meeting. You know, the, the whiteboard out in the paddock is the silo, looking at how you test that your silos are gas tight, um, how you manage your aeration, some retrofitting options on older storage. And, and I mentioned before, if growers are going to store grain for longer periods of time, there's more time for things to go wrong. And one of those little uh, slides, those little pieces of butcher's paper on the side of the silo, is this one here. So effectively, the longer the grain's in the silo, there's more chance of things going wrong. And you need extra levels of management and you've got to consider the infrastructure that you're going to put in. So short term, unsealed's okay. But then if we're going longer term, four, six months plus, particularly when we're getting up in our moistures, aeration is important. And I think this is underutilised currently within the industry. We're getting out further than that and we're getting problems. And, you know, let's be honest, weevils are going to get in and other pests. The only way really for the Australian grower to deal with pests is with gas tight storage. If you get an incursion, you need to have gas tight, not sealed, gas tight to Australian industry standards. And there's a lot of silos that claim they're semi-sealed or sealed. It's a, it's a bit like being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. You're not halfway. Uh, so here's, you know, you, you've been to one, one silo, one shed, you've nearly been to them all, but here's a few of the places I was looking at um, some different storage options. Uh, so Salina in Kansas, one of the biggest uh, wheat elevators in the US. Um, Varner, Ontario in Canada, Canada, Groningen in the Netherlands, so looking at some, um, some movable uh, floor aeration. And then this one is here when I've got home, coming down for the high of the travels, that's my shed and my shovel cleaning out, getting some hygiene right at home. Um, and 
If you want more technical detail, actually, so this is a GRDC uh, funded site, storedgrain.com.au. Um, a lot of that technical analysis, that's a, that's a great spot if you want some more information in that space. Um, so we spoke about it. Grain storage is, you know, 30 year plus type investment. So consider, consider the future. And what's good for one grower is not good for another grower. So it depends what crops you're growing, where you are, what your logistics is like, what your local markets are like, whether you're targeting domestic market, export market. So each, each individual grower is different and you really need to plan accordingly. So this is great. It would be, would be lovely if we could get mainline rail working in Australia, get some of those costs. So let's say it's five or 10 or $15 a tonne, but you know, that, that might not be achievable. I might be dreaming. Uh, one of the things I also did was went to the UK. So the UK is a road only grain market. There's no grain moved by rail in the UK. And we visited uh, a store in, uh, in Somerset, Kennington Grain. Uh, John Collins, and this was within 30 seconds of meeting him, um, he said, if you don't need to dry your grain, store it on farm. So in a road only market, if you don't need to dry your grain, store it on farm. So effectively, if the grower can't, doesn't have the, the scale to justify drying facilities, so if there's not a scale issue, just store it on farm. And I think this is something that really hit home for me. And this is James Peck, a few of the old Nuffield scholars would know him, he's a bit of a character. Uh, grows quite a lot of grain and has got a few uh, shed complexes of his own um, in terms of aeration. So I've spent a few days, I've got, a, I've got a shiny politician shot holding the shovel, but I might get in trouble for, for showing that one. Um, here's one of the other great little visits, one of the gems. Um, that I came across. So this is uh, the Hill family uh, in Ontario, in Canada. Um, so this is the view from uh, Bev Hill, the, the, the father, the, the head of the operation. That's his, the view from his uh, back door. And Jim Hill's running their grain trading operation. Um, effectively, Bev started storing his own grain, could see he could make a quid out of it, started storing for growers in the area. Um, Jim's now running it. And so he's trying to compete with some major you know, ABCD com companies, a uh, ADM, Bungie, Cargill, Dreyfus, in the storage space. What keeps him awake at night is one of these companies are going to tap him on the shoulder and say, Jim, time for you to get out. But the service that these guys can provide, you can't pay, you can't pay employees to provide service like they do in terms of road on the way in and road on the way out. And that's why they're able to achieve what, what they have. So, to sum up, on-farm storage at the grower end is competitive in road movements. Mainline rail is the key driver to improve network efficiency. And I think, to me, regardless of the outcome, on-farm on storage will grow in Australia. But there's some management issues we need to consider. The major bulk handlers have a comparative advantage where scale is important. So we're talking in ports, we're talking in rail, and we're talking in getting grain onto rail. And the thing that was gleamingly obvious, and speaking with people in the grains industry here, that there's a lack of an overall strategic plan to improve efficiency within our network. And I'd really welcome, I know there's some smart people here in the room today, and I'd welcome some questions and discussion in that space. Um, thank you for your time.